Hello, my name is Matt Otwell and welcome to the second video in the series entitled The 40 Year Home Studio Build. In this video I'm going to talk about microphones, microphone preamplifiers and analogue to digital conversion. But before I begin I just want to talk a little bit about my first experiences in recording music. When I was at school in the 1970s I was in a school band with my best friend Pete Griffin. Now Pete was and is a phenomenal guitar player. In fact here's a small clip of him playing a solo on a track of mine called Moon Tin from my second album Given Name. Now there's always one and Pete was the tech savvy member of the band. In those days you've got to remember there was no access to recording studios, we had no idea how things were properly recorded by professionals. But one day he phoned me up and said come over I've got something to show you. I went over to his home and in his bedroom he had a two track, a stereo reel to reel tape recorder and he played me a recording that I couldn't believe. It had him playing the guitar and then there were overdubs on top of it, so there were layered guitars. I couldn't understand how he did it. So he said to me, I've used a process called Sound on Sound. Now the tape recorder he had did not have Sound on Sound facilities. So what he was doing was desoldering the erase and record heads from one channel, recording his guitar on the other, so for example he would record on the left hand channel, then he would unsolder those tape heads, the record and erase heads, play it back whilst recording with another instrument live onto the right hand channel. So he was bouncing backwards and forwards between the channels and as he went he would add another instrument. I thought this was absolutely amazing, I'd never seen anything like it. Of course it was a very delicate operation because he had to keep desoldering and resoldering these little wires. And he said to me, why don't we write a song and we'll make a recording and we can do two or three bounces like this to build up the sounds. So we made this recording, which is our first recording called Push Your Mush. Remember this was the time of punk. We were kind of into Eddie and the Hot Rods, uh, Stiff Records and also Steely Dan. You can hear the influences in this. I would uh, sit there and hit books. I think we had some textbooks that I would hit for the drums. He would play the guitar. I would sing. Once we'd done that we then bounced it over with him adding a guitar solo and I think we did some more harmonies, sort of harmonies. Anyway here's a little snippet of it. <laughs> So a few years later Pete phoned me up and said I'm going to drive up to Barnet in North London and buy a sound on sound tape recorder. Do you want to come? I said do I ever? We got in his car, we drove there, Pete duly brought this tape recorder and it was the Akai 4000 DS. Now the Akai 4000 DS had sound on sound built in, no soldering required. You simply record it on the first track and then you bounce to the second whilst adding another input, a microphone or a guitar or whatever. And we made recordings on this. Eventually Pete sold that to me so I was able to make recordings on it for years and years and that was my sole form of recording. Before he sold that to me I figured out that I could go down to some junk shops and buy myself two portable cassette recorders. Back in the late 70s these were very popular and I could set them up so I recorded onto one of them, it had a cheap ceramic microphone, play that back, position the microphone somewhere between the speaker built into the tape recorder and my guitar 
and bounce that onto a second tape recorder. I could do this a couple of times and build up layers. So that, until Pete sold me the Akai 4000DS, was my way of recording by building up. Of course, you had to make sure that each time you bounced, you got the levels approximately right. But these were very, very primitive recordings. But they got me really excited and interested in sound on sound, and I guess you might call it studio recording. And I think that was kind of the beginning of my recording studio. Two cheap mono cassette recorders brought from junk shops. OK, on to the subject of today's video, which is, of course, microphones, microphone preamplifiers and analogue to digital conversion. I want to share my experiences buying them and using them and uh, just talk a little bit about my journey and what I have learned. So to begin with, I'm going to start with microphone preamplifiers. And here I've got a variety that I've collected over the years. I'm not sure I need all of these anymore, but I've kept them and I want to talk about the pros and cons of them and why I decided on buying them. Uh, the first one I'm going to start with is this Focusrite liquid channel. Now the first 20 years of my recording career, we would go into a recording studio and of course use the microphone preamplifiers that were built into the console. We never really thought twice about it. Often we didn't even know what console would be in that studio. A manager would have booked it or it would simply have been uh, the studio that was available to us or affordable to us at the time. But over the years, with the advent of doors and the demise of the console, of course, microphone preamplifiers, standalone units like this, have become very popular and necessary. And when I first got rid of my large console, I knew I needed something to plug a microphone into so I could record. At the time, I was uh, constantly switching between recording a nylon-strung guitar, a uh, six-string acoustic guitar, uh, a Fender Stratocaster-type guitar, uh, a jazz guitar, and vocals. And often I'd want to compare those before I committed to a recording. And I knew that if I brought some kind of microphone preamplifier that had to be reconfigured every time I wanted to try a different uh, instrument, that was going to be quite time consuming and difficult for me. I could have written down the optimum settings for each of those instruments and then readjusted it to that. But along came this bit of equipment, the Focusrite liquid channel and I realized that it would solve all my problems because as you may know you can save uh, multiple settings in this unit and recall them at a touch of a button. So this uses convolution, it was one of the first units to do that uh, before the UA uh, stuff which is all, of course uh, runs on the CPU of a computer. This is hardware powered and it has inside it uh, actually quite a lot of our hardware electronics for the microphone input so that the microphone uh, sees the correct impedance and loading of the uh, model that it's emulating. It then passes into a convoluted model of a microphone preamplifier and I think there are a hundred or so in this unit. And then the signal can pass if you choose into a compressor and there are another hundred or so compressor modules. Of course they're all convolutions of famous designs. And then there's an EQ and then a digital output so you can send that to your door. So I could instantly uh, put an input into to here, switch to the patch or the program that I wanted and start recording. And this I used for many years and I found it to be absolutely fantastic in terms of its quality and its sound and its, of course, its flexibility. There's no problem with that. One problem with this, of course, is that this is a mono unit. And if you want to record in stereo, you need two of them and that's expensive. So, before I bought this, I was looking at this unit, the Focusrite ISA430. That was a unit of desire because it has everything in it. The microphone preamplifiers, it's got de a great parametric equaliser, um, it's got a limiter, a de and of course it's got analogue to digital conversion and stereo. Although it's a mono unit, it can, uh, you could input two uh, signals to send them to the analogue to digital converters, one coming from the unit itself and one from outside. So eventually I had enough money and I bought this as well, which I've loved. 
But now, of course, I've got this thing where I can't really record in stereo with these two because they're very different units. Even if I set the liquid channel up to have the same models that are in the ISA 430, which you can do, of course, it's difficult to get a, uh, an in-phase stereo signal. So that's all good and well. This is something that I wanted. I had a desire for. It's what's it called? A gear um, acquisition syndrome. And it's been a great unit, but in practice, now that I had these two units, unless I was recording two instruments simultaneously with two musicians, or perhaps recording a guitar and a vocalist, they weren't really doing the job for me. You'll notice that I still have them, because it took me such a long time to afford to buy them, and I'm not getting rid of them. In fact, I would quite like to buy a second liquid channel, but these seem to be uh, holding their value and not come up very often. So, that explains why I brought these two. Remember, I didn't buy these for a long time because these are expensive units and these should last a lifetime. This one here, the ISA 430, has had a VU meter go on it and I simply ordered the spare part and put that back in. It was very simple to do. OK, now, there starts to be a big debate about microphone preamplifiers on YouTube. People talking about how important and how impactful the choice of microphone preamplifier can be on your sound. And I've got a problem with that. And I learnt the hard way. So, I've already said that I couldn't record in stereo. So I thought to myself, OK, there's this new uh, format the 500 series, the API 500 series, why don't I get two stereo microphone preamplifiers? I couldn't afford to buy them off the shelf, so I found a company called Sound Sculptor. They're a French company, and they make versions of the Rupert Neve 1073 microphone preamplifier. By this time, I'd read about this preamplifier, and I thought, OK, sounds interesting. Now, just a little bit of history. Rupert Neve dedicated his life to trying to make the most musical and transparent electronics he could. And of course, one of his big focuses was on designing microphone preamplifiers. And the 1073 represents the most transparent microphone preamplifier he could design with the available components and electronics in the late 60s. And I think we're talking 6970 that he did these. So, his aim was to make a transparent microphone preamplifier. That means it takes the tiny signal coming from a microphone, boosts it up to line level without any distortion, so no changes to the waveform. Now, he couldn't do that because the tolerances of components back in the late 60s wasn't good enough. Typically today, if you're building a bit of equipment and you measure the tolerance of a resistor, for example, it'll be almost spot on or maybe one maybe now and then 2% out of tolerance, but quite rare. Back then, it was quite usual for components to be up to 5, 10, even 15% outside of their tolerances. So it was very difficult to build a device that was completely transparent, that had what we would call flat frequency response. Now, people love these units, the 1073s, because they do have some harmonic distortion to the sound, and they consider that to be musical. I have to say that having brought all of these uh, mic pre's, and I'll go through them all in a minute, the differences between them are very, very small. They are not in any way transformative. Of course, those small differences can be important to a professional uh, engineers and producers who feel comfortable with the particular way that one of these operates. But the sound differences are really very small. One of the sound differences that I've discovered in the 1073 is it has a slightly slower slew rate. Now, the slew rate is the ability of the amplifier to take a signal that's coming in and amplify it, the speed with which it can do that. And for sounds with very fast transients, where the amplifier has to go from virtually no level to a very high level instantly, that can have a slight slope to it, and that can smear the transient so you get less of an attack. It is a very subtle effect. But when I record with these uh, particular pre's, I have quite a poppy sound in my mouth from saliva. I can't help it. It's the way I'm built. And I find that that smooths them off a bit and my vocals are a little bit less poppy. So that's useful for me. 
in terms of the kind of coloration they impart to the signal, it is really, really, really slight. Um, I know there are those who will disagree with me, but um, I don't find a huge difference between any of these. Now, I've got two of them. I built these and sold them together. That was my first DIY project. It was incredibly rewarding, especially when they worked first time. Um, and a little later on, I started to get interesting in this idea of what exactly did these sound like. And I brought two transparent micres, and these are the Grace Design M501s. Now, I don't know if you know about Grace Designs, but they're a US company, and they produce extremely high-quality, modern, transparent audio devices. Uh, and these are two of them. Now, as far as I can tell, and of course it's very difficult to do a comparison, and I'll come back to that, these are pretty well transparent. They impart no character to the signal whatsoever, as, as far as I can tell. Now, there is a big problem here, in that if you want to compare these microphones, the Grace Designs, with the 1073 clones here, and they should be different, it's almost impossible to do that because you need the same sound source coming through a microphone at the same time going to both units. And that's very hard because the microphone is loaded by the input impedances of these mic pre's. Now I think you'll find online that Sound on Sound magazine did a comparison which was as good as you can get of microphone preamplifiers using the Yam Yamaha piano that can play itself and they were therefore able to simultaneously place microphones and use microphone, multiple microphone preamplifiers and compare them. Go and search out that article because it's very revealing and it confirms what I think, which is the difference between these microphone preamplifiers is tiny. It's really tiny. Um, I've got another couple over here. There was a deal for these uh, 11, uh, these 110s, I think, Rupert Neve designed Focusrite uh, microphone preamplifiers. I think these were designed for George Martin's first air studio. And I got a two for one deal. It was too good to turn down at a very cheap rate. So I bought these. At the moment, I use these for recording guitars the microphones that I'm putting on my uh, isolation cabinet and my other cabinets come to these. I think I've got an SM57 here and a Sennheiser E606 on this one here. I tend to record my vocals either from the Grace Design or the Sound Sculpture. Um, but I don't think really it matters. I think I would be more than happy to have just a pair of any of these. And I rarely record more than two signals, a stereo signal, at the same time. As I was investigating this idea of the uh, impact a microphone preamplifier can have on a signal, I brought this, which is a Dave Hill uh, Europa. Now, this is a really unique unit because it allows you to add in odd and even harmonics into the signal. So this is a, an extremely interesting device. But once again, I have to say that the effect of doing this is very, very small. It's a lovely microphone preamplifier. I've got no problems with it, no criticisms of it, uh, but the effect again confirmed my feeling that there's very little difference. Now, I completely understand that there will be those out there who say there's a huge difference, but if you're starting out in recording, or even if you're a little way down the road, trust me, or don't trust me, these will make very little difference probably to the inbuilt microphone preamplifier you have in your more modest audio interface. Now if you've got a modest audio interface with built-in microphone preamplifiers and you trade up to one of these devices you are not going to hear a significant improvement or change in the sound. So let's just put that to rest right now. The tiny adjustments you make to equalization, to effects and to level will be far more impactful than changing your microphone preamplifier. Now, I have one proviso here, of course, and that is that, of course, ergonomically, there are differences between microphone preamplifiers. Some of them have more features than others, and you may need those features. You may need phase reverse, or you may need a trim control. You might need 
all kinds of things. I think we've got impedance uh, controls over here for ribbon microphones. So these are some of the things you might need on your microphone preamplifier. I'm going to make one other point, and that is that some microphone preamplifiers are built to introduce harmonic distortion. And of course, those are the ones that have tubes in them. And that's just great. That's fine. I've got no problem whatsoever with innovative and interesting designs that actually attempt to actively and audibly alter the signal that they're amplifying. That's great. I don't happen to have any tube amplifiers at the moment. Uh, I did have one originally, which was a Tony Larkin's audio uh, voice channel, which was great. I don't at the moment, but unless you intentionally want to uh, change the sound at the microphone preamplifier stage, a transistor-based uh, or digital-based microphone preamplifier will probably suit you best. I want to talk now a little bit about microphones. When I built my first studio capable of multi-track recording at the end of the 1980s, I had a little Studio Master mixing desk and a semi-professional 16-track tape recorder, the Fostex E16. I knew that I needed to buy a large diaphragm capacitor or condenser microphone. That's the standard type of microphone that's used for vocal recording, which was what I was primarily doing. Now today, there is an amazing choice in these microphones. It is absolutely eye-watering how many different microphone manufacturers there are and how many fantastic affordable microphones there are available for a project studio and home studio owner to buy. But at the end of the 1980s, there was virtually nothing. Now I knew, of course, about the Neumann U87, microphone, which is still well known today, and that was around about £700. It was way out of my budget. There was no way I could afford that. The second choice was an AKG 414. That was also a very popular microphone, and that was around about £500, and that was still too much for me. I couldn't afford that. Uh, reading audio a media magazine one day, I read a review of a microphone called the Microtech Gefal UM70. It's a large diaphragm condenser microphone and it had a glowing report and it was about £320 and I could just about afford that. So I simply ordered one and it turned up in a lovely wooden box and this is the microphone. Today this is still in manufacture I believe and I think they're about £1,000. This is my favourite microphone by far. I have used this on everything. Initially, it was the only microphone I had, so I used it on vocals, saxophones, guitars, acoustic guitars, percussion, anything, because it's the only one I had. It's a great microphone. It sounds beautiful. I understand that the capsule inside this was designed by George Neumann. I think it's called the M7 capsule, something like that. And Microtech Geffel were a sort of spin-off of the Neumann company. Um, this microphone I've used recently on my new album, I Is Keen. I recorded all my vocals on it, so I'm still using it to this day. What's that, um, 30, 30 years later? Something like that. So that ticked all the boxes as my first microphone. Okay, next up, I knew I wanted to record in stereo. And so I managed to buy two AKG 451 uh, I think you would call these pencil microphones. They have a small diaphragm and they're very, very transparent. A large diaphragm condenser microphone tends to uh, flatter the sound and give a larger than life sound. These are much more accurate. And of course you can have these as a stereo pair on whatever instrument you want to record. So I use these for congas, acoustic guitars, sometimes for background vocals. They are just fantastic, and these are two of the biggest bargains I have, I have bought. I was very, very lucky. I got this one for £99, and this one for not much more. So they were um, a real steal, and I've been using them ever since. Of course, I brought a Shure SM57, a standard dynamic microphone. Every studio should have one. They're cheap as chips, as they say, and uh, of course, used mainly for recording now guitar amplifier cabinets but they can be used for a range of other things buy one now throughout the 90s more and more manufacturers appeared on the scene and one of those manufacturers was se electronics and i initially brought a valve microphone 
uh, made by them because I wanted to try a valve mic and I really liked it. I think it was called the SE 5700, something like that. Anyway, I don't have it anymore. Um, but towards the end of the 90s, or perhaps it was in the noughties, they released this microphone, which is the SE 4400A, and they sold them in pairs. And I received uh, an email, I must have been subscribed to SE Electronics email list, saying they were going to introduce this microphone at a special event at Air Studios in London. And a colleague of mine thought, well, let's go to it. We haven't been to Air Studios, it would be great to look about. We went up there and the engineers had set up every microphone that you can imagine from U47s, U67s, uh, Telefunkens, uh, AKG microphones, I can't even remember, Brauma microphones, everything under the sun and these. And we're doing a side by side comparison with an acoustic guitarist and I think a drummer. And these sounded fantastic. They were just fantastic. Um, they were at an introductory price offer and I bought them. And I've been using these on acoustic guitars ever since. Now, wonderful microphones, very, very flexible with a lot of features on them and a wide range of polar patterns. So those, those are fantastic. I told you I had this valve microphone and I decided, uh, I think about six or seven years ago, I finally had the budget for a really expensive microphone and I narrowed my research down to the Neumann M149, I think it's called, and I found one on eBay and I drove down to uh, Kent near Canterbury and brought this microphone. Now it's a tube microphone, it's phenomenally uh, good. It's got a very coloured sound, a huge larger than life sound. It's favoured by a lot of famous producers. It's ridiculously expensive. I'm really, really lucky to own it. I've only used it on vocals so far. It's very cumbersome. It requires a very heavyweight stand and a cradle to mount it in. But it's a truly wonderful microphone. And I feel that I've got in my collection at least one premium microphone. I guess this is gear acquisition syndrome as well, isn't it? So I'm very, very lucky to have this. The final microphone I have here is a Shure SM7. And this is a dynamic microphone. And it's, uh, it's a really interesting microphone, I think. And you can use this for all kinds of things. Anything you like, really. It's great on guitar cabinets. It's great on vocals. It's good on anything. It's one of those microphones that you might well put up alongside one of these other condenser microphones for a singer and just see which sounds best. It's not hugely expensive, but it's a lovely microphone. It certainly isn't suitable for every job, but I really enjoy using this one. Now, finally, I just want to say something about my experience of recording microphones. And I think there are a series of factors that determine the quality of the recording you want to make with a microphone. And roughly in order, from the most important to the least, these are the factors, I think. The first factor is that whatever you're recording needs to be a good sound source. So if you're recording a guitarist, they need to have decent strings on their guitars. And of course, the guitar needs to be in tune. If they're playing a saxophone, they need to have a good reed in it. If they're playing the drums, the drums need to be tuned well. That's just paramount. If you don't have a good sound source, if you've got things with squeaks or poor quality sound, your microphone isn't going to be able to compensate for that. The next thing, of course, is the quality of the performance. That's so much more important than anything else. Just, we all know this. Obviously, we strive to get the best performances, um, the most spontaneous, but also the best uh, in terms of feel and, and technical performances, tuning and timing and all those kind of things. We can correct them in the door, but it's best if you can get them live at the time. The next thing that I think is really important is the room that you are recording in. Now, this doesn't go for all scenarios because quite often we're using a cardioid polar pattern and we're close miking, like we're close miking a singer, for example, or we're close miking a guitar cabinet. And in those circumstances, the room matters a lot less or can matter a lot less. So that's really important, the room. Now, I have never had a room in my home studios that has been properly treated for sound. So nearly all of the recordings I do are either close mic'd or maybe I'll bring in a mattress or something like that to deaden things down as best I can. I have a big sofa in the studio and that certainly helps, but sometimes it's just pure luck. And if it really sounds no good, I don't try it. Okay, 
The next thing is the positioning of the microphone. It is absolutely critical how you position a microphone. If you're recording an acoustic guitar, just moving it an inch or two in the direction that it's pointed will have a huge impact on the sound. And therefore, it's always good to position your microphone with a pair of headphones on right where the performer is, moving it around and listening to it. Just use your ears. You would, of course, um, have read lots of advice on how to go about and how to get started. But at the end of the day, if it sounds good to you, it is good. Next up, the choice of microphone. Of course, the choice of microphone is important. Microphones have a huge impact on the quality of sound. There's no question about that. We're not talking, uh, we're not talking about analog to digital converters or microphone preamplifiers, which I think have very little impact. Microphones have a massive impact. So positioning and the microphone. Now, right down at the bottom of the importance scale, the last factor, if you like, well, you guessed it for me, it's microphone preamplifiers. As long as they're basically of a decent quality, they have minimum impact on the sound compared to all of the other factors I just talked about. Now, that's my opinion. Of course, you will have your own opinions and others will disagree, but that's the way that I've gone about recording with microphones, making the decisions I've made and producing the recordings I've recorded. And you can go and listen to my albums and decide for yourself whether you think the sounds I create with microphones are any good or not. I want to talk now briefly about analog to digital converters. And in the studio at the moment, I have three RME 8 in, 8 out converters. So analog in and analog out again. They come up on the patch bay here, the inputs and the outputs. And then the link to the door is an ADAT light pipe, that's eight in, eight out digital, going to the Focusrite RedNet 3. There's three of them here, so there's 24 channels of I.O. And of course the RedNet goes into the door. So that is quite a sophisticated audio interface for the door. Each of these RME converters are expensive, and I was very lucky to buy them secondhand on eBay. It took me five or six years to find them at the price I wanted and I slowly built them up and that now gives me 24 in and out analog to allow me to integrate my analog hardware into the door environment either by sending returns sending audio tracks out through the compressors and the equalizers or sending to effects uh, processors. Now to my ears the conversion that happens with these units is as good as I need. I can't really hear a difference between the input and the output. Once again, I suspect professionals who would analyze these with all kinds of instruments might find a difference, but I can't hear any audio difference. So that is good enough for me. And certainly these are not cheap budget units. Prior to having these units, my first unit was a, I think a, 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 a new bus card in a Power PC Mac, an 8200 that I brought, I think in the mid uh, 1990s. I think that was my first proper uh, computer capable of recording audio. And that card went into a slot in the back of the computer and gave me eight in and eight out analog, plus a SPDIF digital input and output. I would take those eight inputs and outputs and route them into a conventional mixing desk where I could combine them with all the MIDI instruments and drum machines and samplers that I was running live in a mix. Uh, then I would take the stereo output of that and bring that back through the audio work card into the door on a stereo pair uh, of tracks and record my completed mix. And to me, that sounded good also, certainly much better quality than the cheaper analog tape recorders I was using previously. I had a Fostex E16. Now, subsequently, after that PowerPC uh, reached the end of its life, I brought a Firewire interface that allowed me to connect uh, digitally. That was my audio interface. I think it was a TC electronic interface. From there, I actually uh, brought myself a RME Hammerfall card that went into the back of my computer and had ADAT ins and outs, and that linked up to uh, an O1V mixing desk. So the O1V mixing desk 
with its inputs and outputs and that Hammerfall card, that digital connection to the door, was my audio interface. Subsequently, of course, I've acquired all of this equipment over the years and I needed something more powerful and this was the most cost-effective way to do it. Believe it or not, the Focusrite RedNet 3 was the cheapest RedNet device. I think it was a little over a thousand pounds when I bought it. So this has given me uh, a kind of studio level input and output uh, facility that frankly I'm not sure I need anymore, but it was part of my dream and part of my journey. Now in terms of the quality of analog to digital conversion, I remain unconvinced that even budget converters are that much worse than this. In fact, I can't really hear a difference uh, between recordings recorded into a, um, a Focusrite um, Scarlett Solo, or I think they're called Duos, or a Claret, and, and this system here. It is true, I'm a little older and my hearing isn't what it was, but as far as I'm concerned, like with the mic preamplifiers, analog to digital conversion, I think, for most studio owners, is the least of their concerns. Much more important to other bits of gear in the studio, including also your decisions. That is, the decisions you make. All those small decisions you make in equalization, in balancing, in panning, in effects, in compression and dynamics, they are much more impactful on the quality of your sound than either microphone preamplifiers or analog to digital inverters. So my belief is that even the most budget-friendly microphone preamplifiers and analog to digital converters and audio interfaces will give you great sound and they won't impact negatively on your productions. So that's it for this video. I'll be back in a couple of weeks time with the next video in this series, the 40-year home studio build. My name is Matt Otwell. And thank you so much for watching.